in, in the past, we were, uh, we, I think several times in the past, we have looked at Paul's description of, of Moses when he went up on the mountain. Remember the scene? He goes up on the mountain to get the law. And while he's up there with God for an extended period of time, even though he's not really seen God face to face exactly, he's, he's, he's there in the presence of God, and God's glory is radiating on Moses. And as he radiates on Moses, literally Moses comes down the mountain, and he's glowing from just radiating the glory and majesty of God. Now, I used to think when I was a kid that Moses, when he put a veil over, he was embarrassed by the radiance of God until he put on a veil. That wasn't it at all, because after Moses was away from the glory of God, the, the glory begins to fade. Moses didn't want people to see that. So he puts the veil over him so they won't see the glory fading. Now, Paul made the point that we who are in Christ have something better than Moses. When God saves us, he said... In effect, the veil is lifted, not only allowing us to experience something of God's glory now, but actually, and, and to reflect that glory, but actually as we mature in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not like Moses' experience where he goes up on the mountain, he sees God, and, and God's glory radiates, and then it begins to fade. Rather, as believers, it's that we, in the presence of God, as it were, in our relationship to God, the glory continues to grow. In fact, that was Paul's point in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, when he says, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, so we're seeing him, we are being transformed into the same image, that is the image of God, as in the image of the Lord Jesus, to, from one degree of glory to, to another. So in other words, it's, it's just continuing on so that as we go through life, as we walk with Christ, as we view him for who he is from the scriptures, and we see who he is, and we're living out that relationship, our lives begin to reflect more and more the glory of God. That's the way it's supposed to work. So God placed us here, and he redeemed us in order that we might bring glory to him. We bring glory. God great pleasure and much glory when we reflect his glory by becoming like his son, the Lord Jesus. So if the goal is to become like Jesus, and if the more we focus on the glory of God, the more we are changed into his likeness, then it makes sense why this is a worthy pursuit. Beholding has a way of becoming as Christians. So to behold him in glory will lead to increasingly becoming like him. One of the things that has puzzled me throughout the years, like how do you become like Jesus? How does that happen? And part of it is recognizing who he is and seeing him for who he is and, and embracing who he is. And the, more we, and the more we see him, the more we expose ourselves to who he is in the scriptures, the more we become like him. So maybe the reason why we're not becoming more and more like Jesus is because we're not being exposed to him, to his glory, as we ought. So over the next few weeks, we're going to consider what it is ultimately. Remember, how does God, how does God respond to our, um, to our becoming? I mean, how does God respond to us? I mean, how does God, how does God look at us? How does God view us? And, and so we're going to see how, what is it that brings God pleasure? What is it that, how, how is it that we, as we live, we bring God pleasure? Have you ever thought about God being a happy God? I mean, just think a little bit. How do you usually visualize God? I mean, I, I guess I used to assume that it would be like a blank, no emotion. Or sometimes, stern but the Bible presents God as a, a joyful God. Now, he's, he's a God of judgment, to be sure. And, and I don't want to take this too far, and I know the word happy is not the best word. But, but God is a happy God, if you will, in terms of he takes great pleasure in what he has made, and he takes great pleasure in his son. And he takes great pleasure when his Believer that people believe in his son and become like his son. He takes great pleasure in that. 
So to know of his delight will help us to please him and to bring him glory. Probably most of our examination of God has to, has to be in relation to us. I mean, for example, we might say God delights in our obedience. Is that true? I'm sure it is. And, and we'll probably consider that at some point. But the first thing I want to make sure we understand is that God delights concerning in himself. Concerning himself. He delights in himself. Two passages we're going to look at to help us in these, understand this. The Father actually speaks from heaven, literally, so other people could hear. The Father spoke from heaven, expressing his pleasure, his delight, his happiness, if you will, in his Son. So if God the Father delights in the Son, then we need to take maybe a closer look. For if our pleasure is in the Son, like the Father's pleasure is in the Son, then we will be doing what we're supposed to be doing, and that will be bringing glory to God. So the pleasure of God really is, the pleasures of God are really a portrait of God. That in which God takes pleasure gives us a picture, a broader picture of who he is. All right, we're going to look at that in just a minute. For you kids who are filling out your um, activity sheets, today we're, look, we're talking about what brings pleasure to God. And there are things, you know, you kids know that there are things that make you happy, that bring you pleasure. That's also true about God. Twice God the Father spoke from heaven about his son that Jesus brought the Father pleasure. So what were those two events? One's a big word, one's not so big, and I'll say them a few times, but see if you can figure that out. And then in the first event, which is actually later, we we're kind of doing it opposite in terms of one happened at the end of Jesus' ministry, one happened at the beginning, we're starting at the end and going to the beginning, okay? So, but the first one we're going to talk about, what, uh, what was on display? What was there about Jesus that was on display? And in the second event, what was on display about Jesus? And then after God the Father said he was pleased with the Son, what did he tell Peter to do in relation to Jesus? Okay, see how well you do? And then let's get started. Let's start with God's delight was in the brightness of his Son's majesty. Here's the verse you are familiar with. This is, this is at the time when Jesus uh, was transfigured before three of his disciples. Okay, this is Matthew 17, verse 5. He, that is Peter, was still speaking. Remember, he was enamored by what was going on. Let's build three tabernacles. I mean, he was, uh, it was, a, it was a, a sad and a strange situation. But Peter is still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen. We who have trusted Jesus as our Savior have been invited to spend eternity with a God of joy. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 23, Enter into the joy of your master. Jesus came and lived and died that God's joy might be in us and that our joy might be full. If God delights in his son, then our joy should be in his son as well, and for the same reasons. In the text before us, Jesus' earthly ministry was coming to an end. So he goes up in the mountain, he takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and while there, the Bible tells us that he was transfigured before them. So this is the transfiguration of Jesus, that's the event. And what happened there, which is a, a strange, but remember when Jesus came to earth, the hymn writer got it right. He was veiled in human flesh. That means here you have God who in all of his glory, he's covered over in flesh. Now, the Bible seems to indicate that we in our present state in unredeemed bodies still, we could not stand in the presence of God in his glory and live. I think that would be accurate. But when Jesus comes to earth, who is Jesus? He's God in the flesh. So he's veiled in human flesh. So he's standing on the mountain, and as he's standing there, he starts to glow. 
And, and what's happening is his, his essential glory starts to come out a little bit so the disciples see this little example of the glory of God in Jesus. That's what's happening. So Peter, as he's speaking, he's quickly drowned out by a voice from the Father from heaven. So here's Jesus. Here's this voice coming out of the sky, out of the heavens. This is my beloved son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So what was God saying? Well, for the moment, there's a glimpse of the father's delight in the son. The father was declaring openly and clearly that he was delighted in his son and that he loved his son. And he gave, to, he gave us, to the disciples and to us through the scriptures a visual demonstration of the Son's unimaginable glory. So the Father was saying, this is my Son whom I love. He is my pleasure. Listen to him was the call to the disciples that they should make him their pleasure as well. But there's more. For God to appear in his essential glory, again, we would be consumed. We would not be able to stand. We cannot look long. For example, if we go outside today and we, we glare into the sun, how long can you look at the sun before you burn up your eyes? I mean, you look a little bit and then, then you've got to stop. We can't look long into the sun without destroying our eyes, so we cannot look long into the glory of God without being destroyed. But for a moment... The Father was saying, in effect, I behold my Son in his radiance every day with love and continued joy. And if I understand it correctly, one day the pleasure of God will be my pleasure as well. And I will be able to see the glory of God and, and, be able, and not be consumed, be overwhelmed, and be able to embrace that and bask in that and love it. So while we remain in the flesh, we can observe the glory of God in the pages of the Bible, and we can experience the glory of God as he's working in us, transforming us into the image of his Son, and we should, for that is the pleasure of the Father, that his Son might be seen in all of his glory, in all that he's made, including us. So you see what's happening when, when Jesus is there being transfigured, and the Father says... This is my beloved son. This is the son of my love. Listen to him. He's reminding the disciples who Jesus is. He is the glorious God. And they are to see him as that. Now, so for a moment, there was a glimpse of the Father's delight. But for a lifetime, there is the declaration of the Father's desire. Peter, speaking on the mountain later reflected on that experience. When he was writing his epistles, in the second epistle, he wrote about that experience of the transfiguration. Here's what he said. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father... And the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Peter left out, listen to him. <laughs> um, I'm not surprised. But, um, and then he says, we ourselves heard that very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter was there when it happened. He was rebuked for his careless words as he was told by the father to listen to him to listen to what Jesus had to say. But Peter's words in this second letter are very intriguing. It was later when Peter understood that the Father was, going, was giving to his Son honor and glory as Jesus revealed his majesty before them. Peter learned that it was the pleasure of the Father to delight in the Son, and Peter learned that he too must find his pleasure in the Son as well. See, I think we go through life and we pretty much go through the routine of life and lots of things happen to us, good and bad, difficult and fun. But, but in the end, ultimately, our lives are called upon that we are to take pleasure in him, in God, to find our joy in him. 
One writer said, imagine being able to enjoy what is most enjoyable with unbound energy and passion forever. That will be true in the presence of the Lord Jesus, who is the delight of his Father. My guess is that Peter learned something about that during his lifetime. The closing words of his final letter suggest that to me. Here's what Peter said at the very end of his last letter, the last thing he wrote that's in Scripture. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. I think Peter had learned what the Father had said to him. This is my beloved Son in whom I love. Um, Listen to him. Peter found his delight in the Lord Jesus, and he found his desire to bring glory to God throughout his life and into eternity. The Father's delight was and is in his Son, in the brightness of his majesty. So the question comes down to, what is my delight? Do I really delight in God? Do I really delight in who he is? So that's where we start. Now the second thing that happens, the second illustration, we're going to now go, here's the transfiguration, right at the end of Jesus' ministry. Now we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of his ministry. What was the first thing that happened that sort of initiated Jesus' public ministry? Remember? His baptism. So John, John the baptizer, had been baptizing people in a baptism of repentance, calling people to repent of their sin. And so Jesus shows up, and John knows who Jesus is. He knows he's the Messiah. John not only knew that, but John was related to Jesus, cousin. He knew who Jesus was, and Jesus comes to John And he wants to be baptized by John. Now that was a weird section in the scripture. That here is the son of God who's coming to be baptized by John. And in fact, John put up lots of resistance. I'm not even worthy to untie the, the laces on your sandals. Much less do this. But here's the passage in Matthew chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold... The heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. As Jesus was about to begin his public ministry now, he's ready to to start. He identifies with the human race when he's baptized. And he completed a portion of the divine assignment, which... um, I don't know for all of what this means, but the scripture says he was, did this to fulfill all, all righteousness. Somehow he's connecting with, with what's going to happen. He's connecting with the human race. He's also affirming what John has been doing up to this point. And as soon as jo- Jesus comes out of the water, John sees something. He sees the Spirit of God descending like a dove, And landing on Jesus, and at the same time, a voice from heaven sounds, This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. What is that saying? It's saying that God the Father is looking down on the Son, and he is giving his stamp of approval on what Jesus has done so far. Now, what has Jesus done so far? His ministry is just ready to begin. So what's he done? For 30 years, where has he been? Been home. He's been a humble servant, working probably in his father's carpenter shop, being the eldest son in a big family, probably his, his uh, earthly father, if I could say it that way, uh, Joseph, probably died at some point. Jesus has been caring for the family. And his father looks down from heaven and he speaks to Jesus He's speaking to John and others there, and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's putting a stamp of approval on all that Jesus has done. The the one thing you can say about Jesus at that point is he demonstrates not his majesty like on the Mount of Transfiguration, but his meekness, his humility. And I would say of this, um, I'm gonna, I would call this the image of the Father's delight. This, this time, again, uh, not flaming brilliance 
like the sun, but soft quietness like a dove. At one point, the Bible speaks of a, um, Matthew actually quotes it in refer, reference to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 12, there's a quotation from Isaiah, from the prophet Isaiah, and it's relating this to Jesus. Here's the prophecy. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. So Jesus is seen and will be seen throughout eternity, like we sang, uh, the choir sang last Sunday, Lion of Judah, <laughs> this marvelous, great, awesome God. But he's also seen as what? A lamb. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Lamb of God. He is before the foundation of the world, this meekness, all these things that happen. He is this. He is this. He is both. And in that, the Father delights. And he delights in the Son taking on flesh and becoming human in order that he might pay for our sin, the ultimate of humility. So the image of the Father's delight is there, but also we need to look at the meaning of the Father's delight. Writing to the Col Colossian assembly, speaking of Jesus, Paul said, and we had this this morning already for the pardon, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us, where? To the kingdom of his beloved son, or the son of his love. Toward us, God stoops in pity and mercy and grace. Toward the son, his son, he is well pleased. He delights in his son. His first great pleasure is pleasure in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. A few verses later in verse 19 of that text, we are told, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. God did not take a man and elevate him to deity. He clothed, he clothed this one who is equal with the Father. He clothes him in this virgin-born human nature. One writer said it this way, In Jesus Christ meets infinite highness and infinite condescension, infinite justice and infinite grace, infinite glory and infinite humility, infinite majesty and transcendent meekness, absolute perfection with great patience, absolute supremacy with perfect obedience, absolute self-sufficiency in complete trust and reliance on God. Do, do, do you see what was going on with the fathers? He takes great delight in the son. Now, when Jesus was toward the end of his ministry, in fact, the night that he was Betrayed the very night before he was crucified. He was praying to the Father in John 17. Here's what he said. I have made known to them, he's talking to the Father, I've made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That's really the only way that that we become Christ-like is, is as as we recognize that from the Father's love for the Son and pleasure in the Son, then he works in us to transform us so that he might take pleasure in us as we become like the Son. I'm trying. <clears throat> let, me, let me quote somebody that I think does a little bit better job than I may be able to say this, but... This is kind of a long quote, but listen carefully. We may conclude that the pleasure of God in his Son is pleasure in himself. Since the Son is the image of God and the radiance of God and the form of God, equal with God, and indeed is God, therefore God's delight in his Son is delight in himself. Now, in the whole Trinitarian idea that gets, you know, sometimes when you read about that, you think, okay, one God, three persons, you know, and, and then your smoke starts to come out of your ears. I mean, you can't figure that out. And you don't need to, but it's truth. And so God, in taking delight in his son, he's taking delight in himself. 
the quote continues, the original, the primal, the deepest, the foundational joy of God is the joy he has in his own perfections as he sees them reflected in the glory of his Son. Paul speaks of the glory of God in the face of Christ. For all eternity, God has held the panorama of his own perfections in the face of his Son. All that he is, he sees reflected fully and perfectly in the countenance of his Son. And in this, he rejoices with infinite joy. At first, this sounds like vanity. It would be vanity if we humans found our deepest joy in looking in the mirror. Can you imagine? Wow, what a great portrait. And we would be vain and we would be conceited and we, I'm quoting back again, that was not in the quote. Okay, we, we would be vain and conceited and smug and selfish if we were like God in, in that regard. But why? Aren't we supposed to imitate God? Yeah, in some ways, but not in every way. That was the first deceit of Satan in the Garden of Eden. He tempted Adam and Eve to try to be like God in a way that God never intended them to be like him. Namely, self-reliant. Only God should be self-reliant. All the rest of us should be God-reliant. In the same way, we were created for something infinitely better and nobler and greater and deeper than self-contemplation. We were created for the contemplation and enjoyment of God. Anything less than this would be idolatry toward him and disappointment for us. God is the most glorious of all beings. Not to love him and delight in him is, to, is a great loss to us, but it also insults him. But the same is true for God. How shall God not insult what is infinitely beautiful and glorious? How shall God not commit adultery? There is only one possible answer. God must love and delight in his own beauty and perfection above all things. Now, this is a little complicated, but you can see what's happening. When, when we start to think we're something really special, then what we're doing is we're putting ourselves above God. But nobody's above God, so for God to, to recognize himself and to take pleasure in himself and all those things are for, certainly appropriate. If he did it for anybody else, that would be wrong because he's God. Back to the quote. How shall God not insult what is infinitely beautiful and glorious? How shall God not commit adultery? There is only one possible answer. God must love and delight in his own beauty and perfection above all things. For us to do this in front of a mirror is the essence of vanity. For God to do it in the front of his son is the essence of righteousness. God the Father delighted himself in his Son, both in the brightness of his majesty. When Jesus is transfigured, this is my beloved Son, this is the one I love. When he did it in humility, as pictured at the baptism, this is my beloved Son. Both in majesty and meekness, here is the Father crying, calling out to the son and saying, this is my son. He is the one in whom I love, the one in whom I take pleasure. One more quote. The gospel is the good news that God is the all-satisfying end of all of our longings. That even though he does not need us, and in fact estranged from us because of our God-belittling sins, he has in the great love with which he loved us, made a way for sinners to drink the river of his delights through Jesus Christ. And we will not be enthralled by the good news unless we feel that he was not obligated to do this. He was not coerced or constrained by our value. That's why I was really frustrated last week by that marquee thing I saw. You're worth it. No, that's not right. He is the center of the gospel. The exaltation of his glory is the driving force of the gospel. The gospel is a gospel of grace. And grace is the pleasure of God to magnify the worth of God by giving sinners the right and power to delight in God without obscuring the glory of God. That's exactly what it is. So God made this 
way to call us to him and to save us. That brings him glory. That does not, when I respond to him and I, I love him and I care about him and I, I want to magnify his name, that just gives him greater glory. So again, that last sentence, the gospel is the gospel of grace. The gospel is the pleasure of God to magnify the worth of God by giving sinners the right and power to delight in God without obscuring the glory of God. And so Jesus said in that prayer in John 17, I made known to you, I'm sorry, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. God takes pleasure in his son. And when we find our deepest pleasure in Christ, God takes pleasure in us. Now it starts at salvation. But part of this idea, as I, as I recognize my whole life is to give glory to him, pl take pleasure in him. As that's happening, guess what's happening to me? That's where that transformation thing starts. So the more I'm focused on Christ and who he is and what he's done, the more I bask in that, the more God begins to make me glow with the glory of God. Not mine, his. I'm just reflecting it. So if we go back to that 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18 idea, as we, as we behold God's glory, we are beholding what God the Father sees in his Son. And his majesty, and his meekness, that is, his glory is actually changing us into this ever-increasing glory, all of that for his good pleasure. So if, when, when the father looks at his son and he takes pleasure in his son, that has ramifications for me. Because as he takes pleasure in his son and I seek to honor his son and glorify his son and live for for his son, then he is working in me so that I will reflect more and more of the glory of God. One of the big problems I think we have in Christianity, and this, this is all of us, is that we are preoccupied with everything else and we're not focused on Jesus and what he's doing in us. The transformation may be happening, but it's pretty cloudy. But the more I look to him and trust in him and glory in who Jesus is and recognize what I am in Christ, then the glory of God begins to radiate. And people will notice. And God's name will be glorified. Pleasure of God. What does he take delight in? He takes delight in his son and all who take delight in his son. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, helping us to look at something that's kind of complicated, kind of difficult to grasp, but... Thank you for giving us a little bit of a glimpse in these two events, at the transfiguration, the baptism, seeing Jesus' majesty and seeing his humility, his meekness, and realizing that in both of those you took pleasure and you take pleasure in us when we see the majesty of Jesus and we see his humility and we reflect on not only that he is he is the second person of the triune God, but also that he became flesh and dwelt among us. But even in the scriptures you said, of the, of the apostles, they saw his glory. We want to see the glory of Jesus, and we want to reflect the glory of Jesus, and we want to, we want to be able to take pleasure in the Lord Jesus so that you continue in an effective manner, in a, in a more full manner. You keep transforming us from glory to glory. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for working for, working in hopeless sinners, calling us to yourself, and then transforming us into your likeness. What a wonderful position to be in be becoming like your son. May you speed the process. May we not resist. We pray in your son's name, the Lord Jesus.